Uh, take your Bible, turn to Genesis 23. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just do this sort of quickly. Uh, we already covered Genesis 23 last Sunday night about the death of Sarah. And um, uh, let's see here, that's Deuteronomy. And I remember saying that um, Abraham remarried after Sarah died, and you'll find that in uh, chapter 25. Then, Ab then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. Um, so anyway, but back in Genesis 23, again, what happened in Genesis 23? Well, it was the death of Sarah. And when I was, when I was studying numbers in the Bible for the first time, really, I had a couple of books on, on Bible numbers, and one of them was written by a uh, Baptist evangelist uh, named Ed Velo. I think Brother Reg Kelly knew him, or had met him, or had heard him preach, but he had the book. And um, he's now gone on to be with the Lord. And the other one was written by E.W. Bullinger about a hundred years ago. Now, I kind of liked Velo's book better than Bullinger. Bullinger, I think, had some problems. He's one of these guys that studied the Bible so much, he thought he knew the Bible better than the Bible knows the Bible. And the lineage of Christ in Matthew chapter 1 has 42 names in it. And that's 7 times 6. It's, that's the number. But the lineage of Christ in Luke goes all the way back to Adam, and there are exactly 77 names in that list. Starting from Jesus, going backward all the way to God, you find there's 77 there. That matches. To me, that's perfect. But Bollinger said that there was one man in that lineage list that shouldn't be there. So he recommended that it be taken out, leaving 76. And I'm just going, you're nuts. You don't do that to the Bible. But he said it was a mistake, so I haven't read much of him. But he wrote a, he wrote a book about 100 years ago on numbers. Um, and I know others have. Noah Hutchings wrote one, but I didn't read it at the time. But I had those two sources. And they, had, they both gave a list of what the numbers meant. And so I looked at that, and I read through it. And some of it just didn't quite sound right to me. So I, I just prayed and I said, God, that's what man says. And I believe these men to be at least honorable in their attempt. So God, every man's a liar, but you're not. So God, show me in the Bible what the numbers mean. And the Bible will define them for you. And um, one of the things that I looked at was the, the beginning of the Bible, the Genesis chapter. Genesis 1, the number 1 means beginnings. Number 2 means division. And that's where God took Adam, took the rib out, made the woman. And the 2, the Bible says, became 1. And then the number 3, you have the temptation of Eve by way of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So it represents, on one side it represents sin, the other side it represents resurrection, and it represents um, the Godhead. Um, force for the gospel, and you see a gospel story in Genesis chapter 4. Cain, who is of that wicked one, who slew his brother, Abel, because Abel's sacrifice was a righteous sacrifice, and God accepted it. Abel is a type of Christ. His blood, the Bible says, speaks from the ground. Um, thy brother's blood speaketh unto me from the ground, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood. And yet here's Paul saying that Christ's blood speaks better things than that of Abel. So Abel is a type of Christ. Uh, Genesis 5. 5 is a number for death. Uh, and I won't get into the pattern in Genesis 5, but Moses wrote five books called the Pentateuch, Paul called that the law of sin and death. The number six 
represents a couple of things. It represents preparation. Noah prepared the ark in Genesis 6. Uh, if you look, John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus. And what was his job according to scriptures? To prepare ye the way of the Lord. Okay? And there's other evidence that tells you number six stands for preparation. But also... Of course, obviously, it's got to be related to the mark. 600, three score, and six, the number of the beast. What you find in Genesis 6 is the joining together of the sons of God, of the angelic realm, the daughters of men, of the human realm. And it's a mockery. That is a mockery of God or the Holy Spirit planting in Eve the conception of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ being fully God and fully man. So the lesser gods, the angels, deploy a similar program. They married human women and created these evil men called the giants. And they were giant. Some of the tombs that these giants were interred in have been found some of them 15, 20 feet long. We know that Og's bed was almost 14 feet long. That's, that's like standing Matthew on my head. And then, yeah, putting Uriah on top of Matthew's head. You're, you're a little bit taller than two feet though, aren't you? Yeah. So anyway, then we get to the number 23. And it represents, and it tells you here, and Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah, and Sarah died. And the whole chapter is about her death and the burial place of her uh, that uh, Abraham bought. And Abraham purchased it, 400 shekels. That tells you something related to the spiritual realm or the gospel. And I mentioned last week that, that quite possibly uh, God is showing us something related to the place called Abraham's bosom. Because when uh, Sarah died, he purchased this cave. They interred Sarah there. And then uh, when Abraham died, he was put there. Jacob, Isaac were there, Joseph, carry my bones. And so they did that. I think there was something like six people that I counted were in the cave of Machpelah. Uh, but anyway, um, so the number 23 represents death. So who can give me a verse out of scripture that's related to the number 23 that says something about death. Huh? Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Uh, has anybody ever seen this movie? The number 23. It's a Jim Carrey movie. It's like one of the first movies that he made where he wasn't being a clown, okay? And he's a pretty good actor. He was very versatile. And in this one, he played the role of a man that he started hearing things about this number 23. And he finds a book at the library called the number 23. And he's reading the book, and it looks like the story has been written about him. Because all these things that are happening in the book start happening to him, and they revolve around this number 23. Now, they make mention here in the movie that in our, D in our cells, our DNA is bundled into 23 pairs of chromosomes. I always use the number 46 because that's double 23. But either way, you're looking at the same thing. 
23 is the number of deaths. So how would you take the idea of our chromosomes being in 23 pairs and how does that match the theme of death? Give me a verse. And as it is appointed unto man to die, once to die. So we have 23 pairs of chromosomes and built into those, built into our DNA is a, is a device called programmed cell death. Your cells are meant to live about 30 days about a month and that time it has time to divide itself and make new cells and then program cell death kicks in and the cell starts breaking down and going to shreds and then it just turns to nothing the proteins in it are consumed uh, either by something else in the body or it goes out in the waste uh, why, to be blunt, that's why your urine looks a certain color. It's got dead cells in it, and some of those are red blood cells. Um, the only, here's what, here's the thing with cancer. Cancer is basically DNA gone bad. And the interesting thing about it is that true cancer, real cancer, changes the mechanism called programmed cell death and turns it off. That's why tumors keep growing, but our heart doesn't keep growing. Every tissue in your heart, every cell in your heart after 30 days dies. But it's made new ones, it's regenerated itself, so your heart stays the same size. If those cells in your heart didn't die off, your heart would get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That's how it is with cancer and why a tumor can start out like it with Lisa, the head of a pen, and had they not found it when they did, it would have grown into a mass very quickly, very quickly, because those cells don't die. They are, they do exactly what the Bible says. They do, doth eat as a canker. That's how the Bible puts it. It just, it would, it would have consumed her body like it did my grandmother's. So anyway, they made, a, and I was just fascinated by this movie because I'm going, that's weird that they made this movie and it's got, it's got a murder theme in the movie. So they got it right. Who, who wrote this? How did they write it? How did they know? what that number meant. To me, that was interesting. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6, 23 tells us then that the wages of that sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Then look at, turn, turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. This is what I, what I tell you when you're reading something in the Bible and you see a list. Count, count how many things are in that list. Okay? Count that number. Like I did. I, I sat... And, of course, Matthew 1 makes it easy. Because Matthew chapter 1, when it gives you the lineage, it says all the, all the names uh, from Abraham to David are 14. All the names from David to the carrying away of Babylon are 14. And all the names from the carrying away of Babylon to Jesus are 14. So 14 and 14 and 14 is 42. Okay? 7 times 6. But Luke didn't have that. So I just took a pen and I, and I went one, started with Jesus, two, three, four, five. And I double checked it and it's 77 times. And I'm going, 
that's, that's beautiful. That God arranged... See, God's all about timing, isn't He? It can't be Joseph's father being the husband of Mary. It had to be Joseph. He was number 76. Jesus was number 77. And then, that's where it tells you that Adam was the son of God. I like that. Because Adam, we know from Scripture, Romans, that Adam is a foreshadowing of Christ. He's the second Adam or the last Adam, the Bible says. So now look at this list in Romans 1. I remembered this and I thought, I wonder how many is in that list. So I counted it. Being filled with, number one, all in righteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. We have five. Full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity. We have five more. That's ten. Whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud. That's fifteen. Boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers. That's twenty. Without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. That's 23. And then it says, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. See, a lot of times you'll find the meaning there. It, the, and so this is a way, number one, of the Bible telling you what the number 23 means. You count, you do what Solomon said in the 666th chapter of the Bible. I thought, and I started counting chapters too. Now at the time, I didn't have software to do that. So I made a little spreadsheet. And I put all the books of the Bible there, Cubby. And then I put Genesis in the next column, I put 50. And then the next column over was the sum, 50. And then I did Exodus, that has 40. So I put Exodus, 40 chapters, and under that, it would be 90, because 50 and 40 is 90. So that would help me if I had a number in mind, I could at least go to, let's say it was the number 600. So I could look down my list and see which came closest to 600, and then go from there, count forward to the number, whatever chapter or whatever number I was looking for. The 500th chapter of the Bible is uh, Psalm 22. Uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it's all about Christ on the cross who was pierced five times while he was on the cross. The 1,000th chapter of the Bible. 1,000 is the number of years that Christ is going to reign on the earth. Well, that's the kingdom of God. How do you find out how to get to the kingdom of God? You go to the 1,000th chapter and it says, um, you must be born again for you to see the kingdom of God. And I went, that makes sense. It matches. So then I went, I'm going... I wonder if the name of the beast is in the 666th chapter of the Bible. So I counted. It is in Ecclesiastes 7. And I read the whole chapter and I went, it ain't there. But what's there is Solomon saying that I sought out after wisdom to find out wisdom and how things go or something like that. And he said, this I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find the account. And then I remembered Revelation 13 and what it said. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beasts. For is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. So I had two verses. They were both associated with the same number. And they both said, if you want wisdom, count things. They went... That's pretty cool. I'll take that, Lord. Instead of the name, you give me the name whenever. Okay? Uh, so there's 23 things here. Knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. If you favor 
somebody. Let's say your son or your daughter grows up and then you find out that they are a sodomite. You can love them. You can love them with parental love. You can love them with Christian love. You can embrace them, kiss them, hug them, love them. But you don't condone. You don't go say, oh, when am I going to meet the lucky guy? I mean, there's just a way to deal with it. You don't have to be hateful. You don't have to be mean. But it's not right. And Brother Ron Dagonia told me this. And I know the church that he was preaching at. It's in this county. Got invited to preach... Uh, at a church their pastor had resigned it was a small church they were looking for another pastor and he just preached he knew some of the people he had gone to church with them years ago at First Baptist Church in Herculaneum and they were looking forward to him coming he preached and I mean he preached the way Ron does he don't pull any hold anything back he just lets it go and he preached against Sodomy, homosexuality. And he had about a third of the church jump him after church. Saying, why did you do that? Do what? And they chewed him out for preaching on that subject because they thought he knew. There was a family in that church whose son was the music leader. And he had left his wife and children to be with another man. And was in an open relationship with this other man. And they chewed him out for preaching that in that church because they accused him of knowing about that situation and being so judgmental and harsh and trying to rub their nose in it. And they were defending the sodomite over the word of God. They that favor such things are worthy of death too. Okay? Like I say, you can love them, pray for them, be kind to them. Help them out. They're your neighbors. They're your neighbors. They're the ones who have been beaten to death and robbed by the devil and left for dead. And God can use you to bring healing to that person's life. If they want it. But God has to change them. Because you can't. But I've seen it happen. And I believe God, with some of them, it's not to... I, I, the man that I talked to from England, who admitted to me that he was, he was in his 70s, he admitted to me that he was a sodomite. And he said, I can be in a room full of beautiful women and it not phase me one bit. He said, it's my thorn to bear. And he said, I've not practiced it in quite a while. But he said, the sin still resides in my flesh. And I, my heart goes out to him. He wants to go to heaven. And he knows that how he feels is wrong. Well, that's a start right there. Some people's problem is they think what they do is right in the sight of God, and it's not. Anyway, I'm going to move on. Psalm 23, verse 3, He restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. In Numbers 26, look at this. 
Numbers 26, verse 57. These are they that were numbered of the Levites after their families of Gershon, the family of Gershonites, of Kohath, the family of Kohathites, of Merari, the family of um, Merarites. That's Merari, not Furari. Uh, these are the families of the Levites, the family of the Libnites, the family of the Hebronites, the family of the Malites, the family of the Mushites, the family of the Korathites. And Kohath begat Amram, and the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, and daughter of Levi, or the daughter of Levi, whom her mother bare to Levi in Egypt. And she bare unto Amram Aaron and Moses, and Miriam their sister. And unto Aaron was born Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Isn't it neat that the first high priest, a type of Christ, had four sons? I like that. That's the gospel. Then it says... And Nadab and Abihu died when they offered strange fire before the Lord. Now watch this in verse 62. And those that were numbered of them were 20 and 3,000. All males from a month old and upward. Now, what is the significance of the Levite priest being 23,000 in number? Put the two together. What was their main, number one, job that they did? Huh? They killed. They killed animals. That's why Jews make the best butchers in the world. Especially the Cohens and the, Cohens and the Levites and the Kohaths or whatever. Seriously. They know their way around a bull with a knife. 23,000 Levites and their number one job was to offer up sacrifices unto the Lord. Why? Because sin equals death. And their foreshadow is that they are eliminating the penalty of sin, which is death. I just thought, I, I went, oh, it doesn't surprise me now that they started out with exactly 23,000 natural born killers. By the way, Levi was a murderer long before the tribe of Levi came about. You remember that? Remember when... Um, the 12 brothers, remember when their sister Diana went into town and was found and, and raped? It was Le Levi and Simeon, I think, that went into town and killed that booger. Okay? 23,000 Levites. 1 Corinthians 10, 8. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. Wow. Genesis 7, verse 23. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive and they that were with him in the ark. And by the way, this is the 23rd time Noah's name is mentioned in the Bible is in this verse. Verse 23, 23rd time, and it's when everybody on the earth dies. So what's the number 23 represent? The word crucified is found exactly 23 times in the Bible. So now does the Levite priest number make sense? Their sacrifices, their daily sacrifices, were a foreshadow of Christ's one sacrifice by being crucified. In fact, it's so significant, you find it in Luke 23, 23. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. In John 19, 23, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, 
took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. There it is again, associated with the number 23. Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. And the word baptism or baptisms together exactly 23 times in the King James Bible. Because baptism is death, resurrection. I can do this all night. Now watch this. I like this. The devil. The phrase, the devil. Mentioned 46 times. Which, by the way, let's go to Genesis 1. Or Genesis 3. Starting with, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes, that's the 33rd word, shall be opened and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. There's 46 words exactly that he says. Exactly. That he says in Genesis 3. Okay, you can count them. I've counted them a hundred times, 146 times, no. He says 46 words, and what happens? For by man, sin came into the world, and death by sin. He spoke death to her. Isn't that what, was it Proverbs or Ecclesiastes? Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And what did Satan say? 46 words to her. Death. Whereas Christ's words, what did Peter say? When Jesus said, Wilt thou also leave? Peter said, To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Oh, I love this Bible. So the phrase, the devil, the devil, it's mentioned 46 times. That's 23 times 2. That's also the number of chromosomes that you have. 23 pairs, 46 total. Now, why 2? Why twice? Why is it 23 twice? Watch this. Revelation 20.10. And the devil that deceived them. This is the 46th time his name is mentioned. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. What is the lake of fire? Huh? It's the second death. It's 23 death times 2. Which is how many times he's mentioned in the Bible? 46 times. And the word hell is mentioned 23 times in the New Testament. All right, now I'm going to start my sermon for tonight. Uh, I, I am just, I'm going to read some of this just very quickly. We'll dismiss you and we'll talk about it next Sunday night. Uh, ooh, yeah. Genesis 24. What could the number 24 mean? What's it based on? What are the denominators of 24? It's 12 times 2, 6 times 4, but 12 times 2, okay? Um, how many hours are there in a day? So there's 12 in the day, and they're connected to 12 in the night, which then connects 
to the 12 of the next day, correct? Okay. So how many ribs do I have on my right side? I have 12. 12 ribs that go around and connect here. And then I have 12 on this side that connect to the 12 on this side here. And they come around here and connect again. So this could be day and night. I have 12 here and 12 here. The number of elders surrounding the throne of God was 24. So you think, and by the way, we have 12 tribes here, 12 disciples here. Two different groups of people, but will join together as one body. So that's what I think the 24 elders represent. They represent the Jew, the Gentile, the 12 tribes, the 12 apostles. They represent time. There's a time and a season for everything under the sun. So 12 hours in the day, 12 hours in the night, then it starts day again and so on. So guess what we're going to have in Genesis 24? A joining together of a man and his wife. Okay? And it starts out like this. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. What in the world is he doing getting married then in the next chapter? Okay? I mean, it was a miracle for him to you know, conceive in Sarah. Now he's going to get married again. What was he thinking? And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant, his name is Eleazar. We find that in a different place, but that's his name, Eleazar. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. Um, I don't know exactly what that implies. Okay? Um, some say it's related, and I'm going to rate this PG that it's related to the word testimony. Okay, you get what I'm saying? Okay. Um, I, I don't know for sure. Okay, but if you, if you do an etymology study of the word testimony, that's what you're going to find. Okay. But anyway, he... Puts his hand under his thigh. And he says in verse 3, And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Now, whenever you see a marriage in the Bible, it's either going to be Christ and his bride, or Antichrist and his harlot. Okay? One of the two. That's what it... You have the sons of God and daughters of men. When Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, for as in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. And the only, the only reference to marriages in the Bible in the days of Noah were the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they chose them wives and they made them wives of which they chose. So anyway, um, this is going to be a picture of Christ. His bride is going to be us. We're his bride. We're his wife. Paul said, um, husbands love your wives as Christ um, loved the church and gave himself for it. Behold, I speak a great mystery, but I speak of Christ and the church. 
Psalm 19 says the sun is, is in a tabernacle called heaven and goes east to west, just like the priest did in the tabernacle, east to west. And he said it's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. Okay? Um, references to the bride and the bridegroom all through the scriptures. God says of Babylon, I will remove from you the sound of the voice of the bridegroom and the bride. Meaning, wherever Babylon is, Jesus and his church will not be there. Now think about that for a while. Amen? We don't mix ourselves with Babylonian churches. Not going to. So this is Christ. And this is, so think of Abraham as God. And he sends his servant out to go and find a willing, a willing wife. Because we're going to find out in this chapter whether or not it was um, Rebecca's choice to go and be Isaac's wife. Generally, back then, you were a female, you didn't get a choice. And poor Isaac, he's 40 years old and doesn't have a wife and hasn't picked one for himself. Abraham, his father's going to go do it for him. Boy, dad, she better be pretty is all I got to say. Okay, so do not, he said, get one out of the Canaanites. Those are the heathen. That's the world. God tells us, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I was always taught in this church, from as young as I can remember all the way up, that if you choose... Uh, a date first of all never date somebody you wouldn't marry and I'm going that's pretty good advice um, and then if you choose somebody that you think you might marry you better make sure you believe the same things. well when I was a junior in high school, there was a, tr a trumpet player. No, I was a senior. And there was a trumpet player named Colleen. And she was cute. She was kind of short. And, you know, we'd be in band, and I'd kind of look at her, and she'd look at me, and, you know, you look away, you know. Well, then I found out that she kind of liked me. Well, those words didn't come my way very often, okay? And I knew she went to church. She was a, a Baptist. And so um, I asked her out. And she said, yeah, so uh, I can't remember where we went. We went on, I don't know, maybe three, four dates, something like that. We saw each other every day in, in the hallway at school, in band. We'd sit together, things like that. And uh, I'd hold her hand and, you know, we were just... And then um, we'd talk on the telephone. You remember those things? Telephone. Hello? Yeah, Mike's here. Mike, it's Colleen. So we'd talk on the phone. One night, she commenced to tell me that she talked to her pastor. And I thought, she's a good Christian girl. Going to a Baptist church. That's close. So, okay. She said, you know, I was talking to my pastor. You guys, you go to that Free Will Baptist Church. I said, yeah. And he said that you guys aren't saved. Do what? Yeah, you guys, no, your, your church, you're not saved. How's that? 
Well, you believe you lose your salvation every time you do something wrong. I said, hold on a minute. That's not, that is not it. And we started a theological discussion that turned into an argument that ended up with me slamming the phone down. And that was the end of Colleen. Call me up and have the nerve to tell me that I'm not going to heaven because I'm not going to their church and I'm pointing in the direction that their church is in. So, pastor was right. Better pick somebody that agrees with you, especially when it comes to God. And... I had a girlfriend out in college, and I had our whole life planned out, planned out, and she dropped me like a bad habit, went to a, a state school, a college up in northern Oklahoma, and now, Chris, get this, you know what she's doing now? She is the assistant pastor of a mega church up in Kansas. Mm. So, after she broke up with me, my sister called me from out in, when I was out in college and she said, um, you remember Lisa Leonard? I said, yeah. She heard you broke up with Missy. I said, yeah. She said she feels sorry for you and she, she'll go out with you when you come home for Christmas break. If I'm lying, I'm dying. And we started going out then. And that was uh, December of 86. We were married July of 87. So God gave me a wife, not only a Christian wife, but from the same church, same background, and even when I was, hey, the NIV says this, she didn't like it, never did. I bought her an NIV for her birthday, it cost me 50 bucks, and in 19... 92, that was about a fourth of my weekly salary. And uh, she hated it. I've still got the, book, the Bible. Um, but she stuck King James the whole time. And I thank God for her every day. So, let God pick your wife for you. Amen? Young people, let God pick your wife or your husband for you. He'll do a better job than you will anyway. Okay? And they tell you, follow your heart. No, 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 no. Your heart will deceive you every time. Follow the Lord. Amen? Let's stand. Father in heaven, I love you. Thank you, God, for this book. It is absolutely amazing. It has your signature, your handiwork, all over it, on every page, every line, every symbol, every promise, every doctrine, every prophecy, every number, every symbol. Lord, this Bible is yours cover to cover. Top to bottom, from the beginning to the end, this book is right in everything it says. And it's full of treasures and it's full of wonders. Father, this is better than any Hollywood movie. This is better than the best video game. This is, this is sweeter than the sweetest music ever written. God, this book is absolutely phenomenal. And that's understating it all. Lord, I love this Bible. I pray, dear God, that you would open up my eyes, help me to see more. Open up your people's eyes and help them to behold wondrous things out of your law. 
thank you, God, for my wife. And I thank you, Lord, for what brought us together. And Lord, I thank you, God, that you have blessed her in my life and used her to help me, Lord, see my way clear. Bless, Father, these young people, Lord, who go about seeking a mate. And pray, dear God, that you would guide them. They would call upon you and ask for your help. Lord, just bless them now. Dismiss us in your care. Watch over us this week. Father, just fill us with your goodness, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.